thank you so much for giving us the opportunity now. We ask you that you guide us into all the truth, that you show us uh, a, a personal message to each one, that we know how we can relate to this and we can experience a transformation in our hearts and minds. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Okay, so this is the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Okay, usually when you hear the, a sermon on the commandment, thou shalt not kill. By the way, which commandment is this? Remember? Commandment number? Seven. No, no, seven? Six. Number six, that's right. You were close. You were close. <laughs> thou shalt not kill. Um, usually the emphasis that many, many present, uh, when they do this presentation, the emphasis is on trying to define which word should be here, you know, kill or murder, right? Uh, this is the King James Version, but it's interesting that the New King James Version actually translates this as, thou shalt not murder, okay? Now, now my presentation is not going to go in that direction. I'm just going to briefly explain what is the idea. Uh, the word kill in the original Hebrew is the word ratzach, okay? Ratzach. Now, this word ratzach is never used in the context of animal sacrifice, Okay? So this commandment is not really prohibiting, you know, the service that, that the Israelites did in the Old Testament. This word, ratzach, is not used also in the context of capital punishment or in the judgments of God upon those that reject the life. When God takes the life away from them, it doesn't, it, it, this word is not used to define the, the acts of God. So it makes sense, you know, to say that instead of thou shalt not kill, it said thou shalt not murder because God never kills, I mean, get, never murders, I'm sorry, right? But he removes the lives of those that decide not to have it, right? So again, that's just a summary. Uh, I'm not saying it's not important, but the, the direction that now I'm going to take is a little bit different. We're going to deal with the principle of thou shalt not kill, which I think it's, it's, it's more practical. Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 gives us a proper understanding to the commandments. This is something I've repeated many times, but I'm just going to repeat it again because I think it makes, it makes the point. You know, remember, Matthew 5, 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. The word fulfill is the, Hebrew, is the Greek word paleto, okay, which can be translated as perfect or fully preach. Fully preach, okay? That is, the, that is the idea. Jesus is saying, do not think that I come to destroy the law of the prophets. I come to fully preach the law. I come to give you an understanding of the law, a proper understanding. When you read Matthew 5, the whole chapter, you notice that that's exactly what Jesus was trying to say. Because you go to Matthew 5.27, it says, You have heard that it was said by them of all time, Thou shalt not commit Adultery. So this is the commandment number seven. And then Jesus says, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her had committed adultery with her already in his heart. In his heart. Right? So Jesus is pointing people to the proper understanding of the law. And he is telling them the law can be broken even before you commit the physical act. The law can be broken before you do or is manifested in your acts. The law can be broken in your mind. So it makes sense that Jesus says in the book of Hebrews that the covenant that he wants to make with his people is to put in his law where? In their minds and in their hearts. Because this is where everything begins. This is where you break the law. Everything else is just an expression of what came first in here. Right? Now, have you heard of my newest Bible translation? How many of you have heard about that? No? That's right. You haven't heard about that because it's my newest Bible translation. <laughs> and I'm going to, I, 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 the reason why I did this is because I want to make a point with how to understand the commandments of God. Okay? Which commandment is the first commandment? Thou shall have, well, I know, I know that it, it, it begins first, that's right, it begins, it begins um, before the commandment number one, right? But thou shalt have no other gods before me. Okay? So I put this. Thou shalt not praise yourself. Right? 
Like, even though the Bible doesn't say this in the commandments, it really says this. You know what I'm saying? Is, is the principle. That's right. Second commandment. Thou shalt no make graven image. That's right. Nor bow. Right? So I put this. Thou shalt not look yourself at the mirror every five minutes. <laughs> you see, it doesn't say that, but it's implied. And we become the, you know, the, the, the greatest hindrance for God to work in our minds, in our hearts. Because we break the commandments uh, in our minds. Now, this, the third commandment is, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord God in vain. So I just put this, Thou shalt not say, you know, OMG, right? Because we use that word for many things. Or at least, you know, there are many people. And there is a lot of variations about this. You know, and instead of saying, oh, you know, oh my, then we put some other thing there. Right? But the idea is still the same. <laughs> now, number four. Which one is it? Commandment number four. Remember the Sabbath, right? To keep it holy. So I put, thou shalt not talk about your favorite soap opera on Sabbath. See, because... It's not just about coming to church. It's about what we speak. It's about what we do. It's about what it comes to our minds. Right? We, we can be here, you know, listening to, uh, I mean, our eyes, you know, are looking at the, at, the, at the preacher. But our minds, right, are in China just fighting the coronavirus or doing something else. Or our minds can be at work. Or our minds can be on the daily things that we do. Our minds can be, you know, doing things of the regular week. We think we are keeping the Sabbath, but we're not. That was the problem of the Pharisees. They thought, we are keeping the commandments. No, they weren't. They weren't. So we might fall into that same uh, aspect. No, commandment number five? Okay. Honor your parents. Honor your father and your mother. That's right. So I put this. Thou shalt not have a boyfriend that your parents don't approve. <laughs> right? <laughs> or girlfriend. That's right. <laughs> That's right. See? Even though the commandment doesn't say this, it really says this. It's there. Right? So when you understand uh, this commandment as a principle, then every decision is affected by the commandments of God. Commandment number six, thou shalt not kill. Okay? So are you ready for the next one? <laughs> All right. Thou shalt not drink Coca-Cola. Right? That's right. See, I've, I've, I've heard a lot of people that say, well, there is not a commandment that says, you know, thou shalt not eat these, or thou shalt not smoke, right? Or thou shalt not drink, right? But even though the commandment doesn't say it, it really is really there. See, Jesus came not to destroy the law of the prophets. He came to fully preach, right? Now, why, why I'm saying this, right? Everything that tends to shorten the life of people, it doesn't matter what it is, is a violation of the sixth commandment. Sister White says, in a less or, or, or greater degree. Next commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. I think this is self-explanatory. Thou shalt not watch pornography, right? That's right. You're looking in your mind. Number eight, thou shalt not steal. I put thou shalt not copy on the test, right? And this is a very you know, particular one because I, I never thought that I was breaking the commandment when I was in school. But see... That's the reason why we need to understand the commandments of God that needs to be placed here. This is, this is, this is the, command, the, com the covenant that God wants to make. Now, I'm going to put the next one, okay? And maybe some people might get offended at what I'm going to say. But um, commandment number nine, I put just commandment number nine. I didn't put commandment number ten because I want to show you something. I want to show you that even though commandment nine is not ten, it might be ten and it might be eight and it might be seven. You remember that the book of James says that if you break one, right, because it's, everything is interconnected, okay? It's about loyalty. Commandment number nine is, thou shalt not lie, right? Thou shalt not bear fault with, thou shalt not lie. Well, I put this, thou shalt not play video games. Now I'm looking to see what's in there. <laughs> see, playing video games is, what is that usually video games are about? It's about murder, right? It's about killing competition. It's about, you know, you see a lot of profanity in those things, right? You, you, you see people basically violating every single principle there. Every principle, they're violating that. 
even the 10, right? You see all this. Well, you might say, well, not all the video games are really breaking. All the I mean, which, which video games do you play? Right? Which video games do you play? <laughs> right? So all these principles are broken. Again, uh, so we should not think about the commandments as 10 things not to do, but as principles that govern every decision that we make in life. Now, we're going to go with the commandment number six. Uh, Patriarchs and Prophets says this. All acts of injustice that tend to shorten life, the spirit of hatred and revenge, or the indulgence of any passion that leads to injurious acts toward others, or causes us to even wish them harm, a selfish neglect of caring for the needy or suffering, all self-indulgence or unnecessary deprivation or excessive labor. Have you thought about that before? Excessive labor can also be a violation that tends to injure health. All these are to a greater or less degree violation of the sixth commandment. Okay? Right? Now remember. Well, we're, go we're going to mention this later. Matthew 5.21, Jesus speaking about the sixth commandment says, Ye have heard that it was said of all time, Thou shalt not kill. Okay, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. Now Jesus is going to fully preach the commandment says, But I say unto you that whosoever is his what? Angry. Angry with his brother without a cause. Another version says, In vain. There is no reason. Shall be in danger of judgment. So how many murders do we have here? How many people have you killed before? See? How many times have you really violated this commandment? The Bible is telling us that when you use this as a principle, then you understand, oh man, I'm guilty of this. I'm guilty of this. Then Jesus says, And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka shall be in danger of the council. See, Raka was a word that it was used to insult people. It was not a... It, it was like a condemnation, right? It was like saying, you know, you're... You're fool, right? Something like that. Well, since we can use this as a principle, I put the word stupid there, right? And whosoever shall say to his brother stupid shall be in danger of the council. Well, you might say, well, I've never used that word to say to other people. I've never, I've never said stupid to anyone. Well, have you thought it, right? Because it's not about what you say, but it's about what you think. And the Bible says that if, if it comes to your mind or your heart, you have already broken the commandment. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. See, fool, right? Well, since we are using a principle, I'll put dummy, right? But whosoever shall say, Thou dummy, shall be in danger of hellfire. See, maybe you have never used those words, but have you thought about that? Have you thought about your brother, or your friend, or your parents, or your, you know, or your wife, or your husband? Oh, man. You know, all those things in your mind, right? What kind of behavior we are copying when we murder people? Well, Matthew 8, 44 says, speaking about Satan, he, Satan, or he, was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. That's why the Bible says, whosoever hated his brother is a murderer. Now, you might say, well, I'm not hate my brother. Well, remember, maybe you're just angry with your brother. Well, well, I'm not angry. Well, maybe you were just upset. Well, I'm not upset. Well, well, maybe you have something against your brother, right? It's a murder, he says. And you know that no murderer had eternal, li uh, eternal life abiding in him. But he that hated his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because that darkness had blinded his eyes, okay? So you can, put word, you can put the word there that fits fits that same pattern. You can put hate, you can put anger, you can put, you know, I don't like that person, right? Or you can put rude. Have you been rude to other people? Well, even though it's not something that Jesus specifically said, Jesus implied that. Now, is there something in the Bible that, we, that Jesus commanded us to hate? Is, right? Jesus is really commanding us to do that hate 
towards the specific thing. Notice what Revelation chapter 2 verse 6 says. But these thou hast, that thou hatest, what? The deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So Jesus is saying, the thing that you really have to hate is the deeds. It's sin. It's, it's not the person. It's the deeds of the Nicolaitans. It's the deeds which, which, which are sin. It's, you know, it doesn't say, thou shalt hate the one that comes to church with a mask. Thou shalt not hate the one that comes to the church without a mask. Thou shalt not hate the one that takes your place where you sit every Sabbath, right? Thou shalt not hate those that come late to church. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not it's, it's specifying anything, okay? He <laughs> says, thou shalt hate the deeds. See, people are loved by God. You know, some, some, some person mentioned in a church, well, I think Satan hates, I mean, God hates Satan. No, according to the Bible, God doesn't hate Satan. He hates, he hates the deeds. He hates the deeds. Now, remember that Jesus mentioned this specific uh, sequence when he was speaking to the people. He says, if you get angry, you might be in danger of judgment. If you call your brother Raka, you might be in danger of counsel. And if you call your brother fool, you might be in danger of hellfire. So God, whatever is telling here, Jesus, is telling you, you need to avoid those things. Otherwise, you're going to be condemned, right? God doesn't want you to be condemned. He says that's why you need to avoid killing people. So we need to bring a message. We need to bring a message to the world that avoids people killing one another. So do you, do, do you connect something in your mind that has to do with judgment and hellfire? A message that maybe God is calling us to share to the world and to the whole inhabitant of the earth? In the midst of heaven? <laughs> That's right. See, the first angel says, fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment is come. The first angel's message is saying, be careful of what you say because you might be in danger of entering into the judgment. The message is warning people against falling into the judgment. That's why you don't get angry. You don't get upset. You're not rude. Otherwise, you're going to be in danger of judgment. Second angel is Babylon is fallen. It's fallen. So, you know, the council, the council was the Sanhedrin. That was the place where people were, were given a sentence. They would, this, the judgment is the process that takes in consideration the, uh, the different um, say evidence. It takes the evidence, and when the evidence is presented before the council, the council makes a decision. Babylon is fallen. It's fallen. Do you, know what, you don't want to be taken to the council because the council might say, well, this person, this person is angry with his brother without a cause. The sentence is, this person is fallen. And of course, you don't want to get to the last time, to the last part, right? Because hellfire is connected also with the third angel's message. That is the sentence that is placed upon those that have violated and gone astray of the commandments of God. So, in other words... The message of Revelation 14 is a warning against hate, against anger, against murder, against being rude, against being upset. Upset. See, that's why the Bible warned us before we commit those kind of sins. God doesn't want us. That's why the Bible says in Leviticus 19, 17, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine hard okay you remember that in isaiah chapter 14 when he, when the bible speaks about lucifer the bible says you that said in your heart i will ascend into heaven i will be like the most high see the rebellion that began in heaven really began in the mind and in the heart of satan the rebellion 
was just an expression of the rebellion that began right here. The Bible says, thou shalt not hate. What's an, what's the, the, this is something that I use as a tool. You know, we were speaking about tools during the Sabbath school lesson. Uh, this is one of the tools that I use in my sermons. I take a Bible verse and I change words in the opposite direction. And when I change those words, it gives me a, uh, a, a, another perspective. And he says the same thing, it's just in another perspective. For instance, thou shalt not hate. What's the opposite word for hate? Love, right? So when the Bible says thou shalt not hate, what is the, what he's telling us? Thou shalt love thy brother. So notice, the Bible is telling us the same thing in the same verse, even though it's not implicit here. That's why when you go one verse after that, in verse 18, it says thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord thy God. So, this is, this is the commandment. You remember that Jesus, uh, there was um, uh, a teacher of the law that says, which one is the, is, is the greatest commandment? And he said, well, the greatest is, you know, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. The next one is similar to this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor, right? Now, well, many people say, well, you know, we don't have to co obey the commandments because now Jesus, Jesus says that it's only two commandments that we need to obey. Now, in reality, it's true if you think about it because when the Bible says thou shalt not kill and the word for kill can be translated as, as hate and the, and the opposite word for hate is love, then when God is telling us thou shalt not kill, he is actually telling us Thou shalt love thy neighbor. See? Amen. It's the same commandment. Thou shalt not kill. It's actually thou shalt love thy neighbor. Thou shalt be loving to thy neighbor. Revelation 14. This is something that is, is, is really exciting. Notice what Revelation 14 says. Okay? It, it, we know that in Revelation 14, the message is about judgment. God is warning the, the whole world about judgment. The judgment is going to come. And you know that the message says, Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment is come. Now, we usually think about this, this uh, verse as, as God making a judgment upon His people, right? It's like God is going to judge His people and He's going to bring, bring the, uh, the sentence upon His people. Now, remember that in the great controversy, there are two parties. And the conflict in between those two parties is really a judgment. What, is the, what kind of judgment is, is, is being played out? Well, the judgment is coming actually from the people against God. The people are saying, well, is God really fair as He says He is? Is God really loving as He says He is? So in the judgment process, it's not only God making a decision upon who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. It's the people making a decision of which God they're going, to, uh, they're going to praise and worship. So you're following that? So the decision comes both sides. God is making a decision based on the evidence and based on the, on the, on, on, on the heart and the mind about who is the true worshiper. And the worshipers are making a decision, they are making a judgment about who are they going to worship. Are they going to worship the beast or are they going to worship God? So when the Bible says the hour of His judgment is come, it's speaking about both things. Now why this is very important. Is there a time in Bible history that we have an example where God was already judged by His people? Which one, Bing? You mentioned that? Where, where, where do we have an example where God was already judged by people? Okay, you said Jesus, right? That's right, when He was crucified, right? Before He went to crucifixion, He was judged. Okay, now notice, notice what is the judgment that people, people made against Jesus. First, before in John 10, 33, the Bible says that the Jews were going to stone Jesus. They wanted to kill Him. And Jesus says, why do you want to kill me? And they, they're going to give the judgment of why they are going to kill Jesus. Notice. It says, the Jews answer him saying, 
for a good work, we stone thee not. In other words, the Jews are saying, we recognize that you're a good man. We recognize that you're good. You do good works. That is not the problem that we have with you. We recognize that you're good. But for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. So he says, the reason why we are killing you, because we are, uh, the reason why we are making a judgment upon you, is because, not because you're good, is because you are making yourself equal to God. Okay? Now, before they actually crucify Jesus, this is what the mob says about Jesus. He says, but they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And then Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? And then the chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Okay, so they chose the person that was going to govern them. So notice, there are three things that we, that we saw in here. Christ is good, right? That's what the Jew says. We know, we recognize that you're good. But Christ cannot be equal with God. That's, that's not true. That, and, and because of that, we don't want Christ to govern us. So they are making a judgment upon God. Okay? Now, I want, I want to take you now to the book Great Controversy. Because Sister White tells us something very insightful in regards to this. Notice what she says. And this is actually the first chapter. We already saw this. The great sin of the Jews was the rejection of Christ. The great sin of the Christian world will be the rejection of the law of God, the foundation of His government in heaven and earth. Right? So Jesus is, uh, I'm sorry, Sister White is saying, in the same way that they rejected Christ, they're going to reject the law. Now, we already said that the great sin of the Jews was Christ is good, right? Christ is not equal with God, and we don't want Christ to govern us. They were condemned because they rejected Christ. Sister White says, well, the same way that they rejected Christ, they're going to reject the law. Isn't that what the people say? The law is good. You ask any Christian. They said the law is good, but the law is not equal with God. The law is not equal with God. Therefore, we don't want the law to govern us. It's exactly the same judgment that people in the Old Testament make against Christ. And now they are making it against the law of God. And the final, 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 final judgment, the, the sentence was, crucify them. Don't you think it's really interesting when people say that the law was nailed in the cross? The people say that the, the law was nailed because that's where they want it. They want to nail the cross. If Jesus was present today, those, were, those will be the same people that will nail Jesus in the cross. Those that want the law to be nailed in the cross are the same. Now you say, well, no, we are seven-day Adventists. We uphold the law of God. We believe that the law of God is still binding, and we obey it. Well, if, if you hate your brother without a cause, if you get angry with your brother, if you, get, if you, if you are rude with your brother, it says you are in danger of the judgment. Why? Because you are breaking the law. And what is sin, really? Sin really means this. Sin, mean, sin means basically rejecting the law. It, it means rejecting Christ to govern you. When, you. when you commit sin, you're telling God, well, God, I know that, you know, I know that your law is good. I know that you are good. But, but this time, I don't want to govern me. I, I, I don't want you to be my governor. I want, I want myself to be my governor. And when you put yourself in the government that's supposed to be God's government, you're making yourself God. Every sin that we commit is an attempt to put ourselves in the place of God. Every sin that we commit is telling God, I want to be the governor. I want, I want to be like the most high. It's exactly the same. See, but we tend to think, well, you know, that's Satan. You know, 
That's all, those are the wicked. No. The reason then for the rejection of the law of God is because he condemns our hate and anger against our brothers and sisters. Well, well I, I don't hate them. I just don't like them. Well, you have said in the past, thou shalt not hate my brother. But I tell you that whosoever doesn't like your brother or sister will be in danger of judgment. See? It's the same thing. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, speaking about love. Love is not rude. It's not self-serving. It's not easily anger or resentful. You know, I, I know that I'm touching many, you know, many hearts and minds in here. Because I, I know that we all have fallen into some these kind of categories. We all have been rude with people. We all have been somehow self-serving and easily angered. But this, see this, this thing, right, is a reflection of Satan's character. Let me show you. So the dragon, who's the dragon? Satan was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. L let me tell you something. You know why Satan is so enraged with the woman? He's angry. He's mad. He, he wants to be rude with the woman. The woman represents the church. You know why he's enraged with the woman? Because the woman is not enraged. You know why Satan is so rude to the woman? It's because the woman is not rude to him. The reason why Satan is angry with the woman is because the woman doesn't get angry. It's full of love. It's because when Satan hates the woman, that woman says, I don't hate you. When someone attacks you, when someone is being rude to you, when someone is disrespectful to you, then you know in the way that you respond, which God is your God. The reason why the dragon is enraged with the woman is because that woman is not easily angered. It's not rude. That woman is a loving woman. That's why the Bible says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When finally the people of God become true witnesses of who Jesus is, when this woman reflects the character of God, which is not easily angered, which is a loving character towards one another, then it says, then the end shall come. Okay, the end shall come. John 13, 35 tells us which is the sign that you can recognize the true woman. See, you think, well, you might think, well, I come to church on Sabbath. I, 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 I believe I'm, I'm, I'm part of the true woman. No, 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 no. Satan is not enraged about, is, is, not, is not anger with everyone. Satan is anger with those angry, with those that do not get angry. Those are specific ones. That's why the Bible says, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If you have Love one another. Again, let me, use, let me use the tool that I use. What is the, what is the uh, word against love? I mean opposite. So by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you hate not one to another. Let me use another one. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you are not rude one to another. Let me use another one. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you are not angry one to another. Let me use another one. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye kill not one to another. See? If you kill not one to another. Now, let me tell you something that I, you know, that I said to, to other church when I was presenting this. Um, sometimes we, we, we believe, well, you know, I used to hate people, right? I used to hate people. I, I'm not speaking about me, but sometimes we think about this a lot. I used to hate people, but now I don't hate everyone. I just, I just, you know, I just, some, some people, not everyone, right? It's just some people that I hate, right? Now imagine 
Imagine this serial killer, right? The serial killer that says, okay, you know, I have come to the Lord. You know, he goes to an evangelistic meeting. He gets baptized and says, well, I'm not a serial killer no more because I used to kill, you know, uh, five people every day. Now I just kill once a day. I mean, would you really believe that he has stopped being a serial killer? Not right. I mean, has he really changed because he just killed one a day? Well, what about once a week? Well, what about once a month? Well, what about once a year? Has that person really changed because he just killed one person? I mean, it's just one person, God. I used to kill hundreds. I, I just, I, now I just kill one. Only one. You are going to condemn me because I hate that one? I killed that one? Remember. Remember, the Bible says that if you, if you, uh, that, that murder or killing also has to do with how you get angry with people. How do you hate people, right? How do you get rude with people? Well, God, now I'm different. I used to be rude with everyone, but now, you know, only with those that I don't like. But it's only once a week, God. It's not every day, you know. It's just, it's just once a week. It's just once a month, right? I mean, this year, I just hated one person. Uh, do you think that is a true loving Christian? That's why Revelation 14, 12 presents to us, before us, the true movement of God. Do you want to know who the true movement of God is? It's the one that is presented in Revelation 14, 12. Let me show you. Here is the, is the patience of the saints. When God finally says, see, this declaration is made before the whole universe. And God is, 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 is presenting his woman before the whole universe. And he's saying, you see this woman? You see my children? They are patient. They're not rude. They don't get easily anger. You see? They have, they have learned how to never get angry. They have learned that. They have, le they have learned to be patient all the time, every day, every month, every year, they have learned it. This is the patience of the saints. All the universe, all the universe, these are the ones that are reflecting my character. This is, this is the ultimate purpose uh, that God wants to accomplish in you. To make you like Him. A loving Christian that doesn't heal. May the Lord guide you and bless you all the days of your life. Why don't we sing? And then we'll pray.